Being fat adapted has been heralded as the road to improved endurance performance. However, is this in fact the case? The training adaptations which contribute to enhanced fat use have been studied for a long time. However, this idea has gained recent popularity and notoriety among advocates of the high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet. In this video, I am not going to review the potential pros and cons of that way of eating, so I will save that for subsequent videos. In this video, I want to talk about what fat adaptation means and address the question as to whether increasing rates of fat oxidation via training rather than dietary manipula manipulation improves performance. This is going to be a bit longer and a little bit complex, so hang in there. But first, let's quickly review how we generate ATP for muscular work. ATP is the energy currency of the body and is what is used to power our workouts, our brains, or anything that requires energy. Without it, well, we would be dead. For endurance exercise, we primarily use two metabolic pathways to generate ATP, beta oxidation, or burning fat, and glycolysis, or burning glucose. Fat can only be used to generate ATP via oxidative pathways, i.e. it requires oxygen. Glucose can be burned with or without oxygen, otherwise known as aerobic and anaerobic glycolysis. The relative contribution of these substrates during exercise depends on several factors including exercise intensity, exercise duration, environmental factors, training status, and dietary intake. There are two constructs that will help inform this discussion, and that is power and capacity. Capacity is how much total energy is available for use. Power is how quickly we can generate that energy. Fat represents an almost inexhaustible store of energy, even in lean athletes, but it is the slowest of all the pathways, i.e. it has high capacity but low power. Glycolysis is more powerful, but its capacity is finite. Our glycogen stores have only enough for 90 minutes to two hours of moderate to intense exercise. Fat adaptation, therefore, is the ability to use more fat at both relative and or absolute workloads. In the research, there are two terms used to describe this, maximal fat oxidation, or MFO, and fat max. MFO is the peak amount of fat that one can oxidize and is expressed in grams per minute. Fat max is defined as the intensity or load at which MFO occurs and is usually expressed as a percentage of VO2 max. Researchers can also look at the total and relative contribution of fat and glucose during a bout of exercise, such as during a marathon. At first blush, an improved ability to burn more fat to power us through a race appears to be advantageous. Fat is an almost unlimited source of energy if only we could quickly access all that lovely fat. But the question at hand is this, will we be able to race faster as a result of being more fat and adapted? But before I look at the research on this, I, want, I think it is important to define what is meant by endurance performance. A definition that I like is one by Louise Burke of the Australian Institute of Sport. She defines it as, and I quote, a sporting competition of greater than 40 minutes of sustained or intermittent high intensity exercise where the outcome is determined by the production of mechanical energy as rapidly or economically as possible throughout the event or at critical moments, end quote. There are a couple of key points that are worth emphasizing. That is that performance depends on the ability to produce energy A quickly and B economically. Another reported benefit of fat adaptation is the idea of glycogen sparing. If you can increase your use of fat, you will spare muscle glycogen. This is seen as helpful as depletion of glycogen is associated with increased feelings of fatigue and a reduction in exercise intensity. Thus, being fat adapted has a lot of intuitive appeal, especially during exercise where carbohydrate availability is limiting. Now training by itself increases fat oxidation rates, especially at lower exercise intensities. As you can see, MFO is higher for those that are better trained, Fat max, however, isn't that much higher and can vary a lot between athletes. So is this helpful to performance or not? This study using male subjects measured substrate use during one hour of cycling at 65% of VO2 max before and after training. 
Post-training, fat oxidation was higher for the same absolute workload, but was not improved at the same relative intensity. In other words, if they were riding at 200 watts at 65%, they oxidized more fat at that same workload post-training. But post-training, 200 watts was now at 54% of VO2 max. At 65% of VO2 max post-training, fat use was exactly the same as 65% of VO2 max pre-training. Thus, carbohydrate was the main fuel during one hour of moderate intensity exercise both before and after training. This study compared trained and untrained athletes and their fuel use during exercise of different intensities. They found that fat oxidation rates were higher in the trained subjects, but only at low intensities, 22 and 40% of VO2 max. However, at higher intensities, it didn't matter how trained they were, fat oxidation rates were the same. Now, the trained subjects were able to produce more power at the higher exercise intensities, but this was supported by an increase in absolute carbohydrate oxidation rates. The authors concluded that the higher intensities at which most athletes train and compete is not supported by an improved ability to burn fat, but rather by higher rates of carbohydrate oxidation. This finding has been supported by other studies showing that while training does improve MFO, it doesn't really improve fat max or the relative intensity at which MFO occurs. So in real world race intensities, athletes are gonna perform at the same relative intensities pre and post training and at intensities that are highly carbohydrate dependent. Thus, this begs the question as to how beneficial increased fat use is under most race scenarios. This study looked at fast and slow marathon runners. Researchers had them complete a marathon on a treadmill under conditions that would be expected to favor fat oxidation, i.e. they were non-carbohydrate loaded, they were overnight fasted, and there was no intake of carbohydrate during the run. Ouch. The fast runners completed the marathon in about two hours and 43 minutes, while the slow runners finished at about three and a half hours. The faster runners sustained a higher fraction of the VO2 max than the slower runners, 75 versus 65% of the VO2 max. There were no differences, however, between the faster or slower runners in the total amount of carbohydrate or fat oxidized. Again, what this demonstrates is that in racing conditions of three to four hours, carbohydrate is by far the predominant fuel and the most important for performance, not fat and that the balance of substrate utilization is unaffected by prior endurance training, even doing moderate intensity exercise. Another factor to consider is that a downside of using fat as fuel is that from an oxygen use perspective, it is more expensive. In other words, it takes more oxygen when using fat to fuel your race than when using carbohydrates, so fat is less economical. Better economy, of course, is an important predictor of endurance performance. So let's do some math. Hypothetically, let's look at an elite male marathon runner who weighs 55 kilos and runs a marathon in just over two hours. The energy cost of running a marathon for someone of this weight is around 0.9 kilocalories per kilo per kilometer. If he were to burn 100% carbohydrate, he gets 5.06 calories per liter of oxygen. If he were to burn 100% fat, he only gets 4.71 calories per liter of oxygen. To put it differently, 417 liters of oxygen is required when only carbohydrate is used, and 445 liters of oxygen is required if only fat is used in order to complete the marathon. As you can see, using fat to fuel a marathon would be an expensive use of oxygen. But does that really matter? Let's say his VO2 max is 80 milliliters per kilo per minute. Based on the above oxygen requirements, if he were burning pure fat, he would have to work at 84% of his VO2 max. By using carbohydrate, he would only have to work at 79% of VO2 max to run the same time. But hang on, I can hear you say, running a marathon on pure fat is just not possible. So kudos to you for thinking that. So to put it into a real world race scenario, let's say athlete A runs the race burning 30% fat and 70% carbohydrate. Athlete B, meanwhile, uses only 10% fat and 90% carbohydrate. All else is equal, i.e. same distance, same weight, and they are running at the same percent of their VO2 max. 
Athlete B, however, is more economical and therefore gets 1.6% more energy per his oxygen use compared to athlete A. Athlete B will be faster by two minutes. Thus, while seeming counterintuitive, the goal during a race is to use as much carbohydrate as possible. If you have it, use it and don't spare it. Carbohydrate is simply more economical to use. It will allow you to go faster for a given use of oxygen. But what about events longer than a marathon, such as an Ironman? This study looked at athletes competing in the Copenhagen Ironman. They did find a significant but weak inverse correlation between MFO and race times. In other words, those who were more fat adapted tended to be faster. However, improved fat adaptation could just be a proxy for higher mitochondrial mass, which is a proxy for being better trained. It is a bit of an, a chicken and an egg question. Are they faster because they are fat adapted or they became fat adapted because they are better trained and were therefore faster. The other problem with the study was they used a wide range of finishing times. Would you see the same correlation within, say, the top 50% performers? Is it the predictive variable? As you can see, probably not. It is all over the place. The study was on men. What about women? It has been observed that females have lower absolute rates of fat oxidation, i.e. lower MFOs, but they have a greater relative fat oxidation. In other words, they use more fat as a percentage of overall energy expenditure compared to males. Thus, women have a greater reliance on fat metabolism during exercise than men. Researchers suspect that this is due to estrogen. In the study of women doing an Ironman, MFO was not an independent predictor of performance. So where does this leave us? Improved ability to use fat at lower intensities is a natural result of training. It represents a positive adaptation. However, intensities that are more typical of racing are just too high for fat to be of much help. Thus, the intensities at which most athletes compete or even train at tend to be carbohydrate dependent. Thus, practically speaking, we really want to be sure to top off those glycogen stores and consume plenty of exogenous carbohydrate during an event. In a subsequent video, I will talk about recommendations for doing that. Now, being able to burn more fat at lower intensities can be useful in those longer, easy training rides or runs and can delay or prevent bonking, especially when carbohydrate intake is limited or there is low glycogen availability. Nevertheless, to conclude, current data shows that high-intensity exercise is carbohydrate rather than fat-dependent and that carbohydrate is more economical. Thus, being fat-adapted is not quite the holy grail to improve performance as has been suggested. But diet can really affect this. For example, consuming a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet can increase one's fat max and MFO above and beyond what can be achieved with just training. In fact, it has been shown to double MFO. So is that helpful? Or what about ultra-endurance events, such as running 100 miles, where intensities are low? Or what if you consume a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet to get fat adapted, then reload the glycogen tank before an event? Is that a good idea? In subsequent videos, I will review the research on this and the proposed pros and cons of this way of eating. So stay tuned. As per usual, please like, share, and subscribe if you find these videos to be interesting and helpful. Thanks for watching.